about that, huh? Uh, so, uh, it is so good to be with you, and it is so humbling and such an honor to, to hear those words uh, from you spoken and knowing um, the incredible history of this church just a little bit. I really feel like I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, people have come before me, and I'm just honored to be able to serve together with you. Um, I'm excited, really excited. I mean, it seems like October was a long time ago now, right? Um, but as you may have heard, maybe a few of you have heard, um, we're here, but our stuff is not here. So uh, it's just stuff, but it's amazing that you begin to rely upon things like end tables and beds and other things. But actually, I wanted to tell you this only because Already we feel so loved um, because there's been such an outpouring of groceries and gift cards and furniture and all these things. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, it really makes us feel incredibly loved. Uh, so um, growing up, I had a chance to share with you that, yes, I, I grew up. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and I have this special memory with my dad. Do you have any special memories with your father? One of my special memories with my dad is he took me every year to a football game. And, um, and this is where I have to tell you that I promise you I am not going to talk about the Cleveland Browns in every one of my sermons. Okay? <laughs> I promise you. But wouldn't it be great if we had a Cleveland Browns 49ers Super Bowl? Yes. Okay, and since you guys have won so many, you wouldn't mind if my team won this time, right? All right. Every year, my dad would take me to the Browns game. And during this season, right, you may remember if you're old enough, names like Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan, Mean Joe Green, okay? Those were the teams that were going against my team. So you know what happened every time? They lost. So all throughout my childhood, I never saw the Browns win in person, ever. And so I took my son a year ago, and I said, we're going to continue this tradition. Let's go to the game. And they're playing the Cardinals, right? I mean, it's the Cardinals. It should be safe. I'm sorry for anybody who's a Cardinal fan. But anyway, we're there. And the Browns get destroyed. And I look to my son and I say, welcome to being a Browns fan. <laughs> I tell you that story for a reason, okay? As I assume this honor of, of being pastor, I need to offer you just a little bit of confession, okay? Every once in a while, I am tempted to see the church just a little bit like the football team that I grew up with. And here's what I mean. A bunch of wonderful, loving people. But it doesn't seem too often that we always are the winning team. And what I mean by this is not this eternal perspective. I mean in the day-to-day. -day. And I mean over the last couple years, it has been a challenge for the church in general. Am I alone? Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right. In 2017, Barna, along with the American Bible Society, did this study to determine the most Bible-minded cities in America. They defined Bible-minded cities as people who believe the Bible and try to do what it says. Take a guess where the Bay Area is on this list. Okay, we are 94 out of 100 cities. Only 15% of our local population qualifies as Bible minded. Barna also released a study about the most de-churched cities in America. They define de-churched as people who went to church at one time 
and now they're not going to church anymore. Guess where we stand on this one? We're number one! <laughs> right? A couple years ago, I should say, by the way, that was before the pandemic, Right? So two years ago, I had an opportunity to hear a guy named Ed Setzer. Maybe you've heard his name. He was on the faculty at Wheaton College, and now he's actually here in California at Talbot. Um, and he affirmed in front of us all, he said, look, I travel around a lot. And he said, on average, he said, on average, each church I've been to has lost close to one third of the people who attended prior to the pandemic because people lost the habit of going to worship. And I'm sure right now you can think of a few people who should be here right now. Just 20 or 30 years ago in our country, even if somebody wasn't a practicing Christian, there was a general agreement when the whole of our population that our morality was based on largely Christian values. Not to mention there was some general agreement that the church it was the, the one place that founded these values within our society, the morality, but not today. Today, you're just as likely to hear somebody out in the world say, actually, the church is just as much a part of the problem. Sadly. So this isn't the first time in the history of God's people where it looked like to God's people, oh my goodness, we're being overwhelmed. Oh my goodness, we're not on the winning team. And the best example I can give you this, the clearest biblical picture is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to open it to 1 Samuel 17. I can only put so much up on a slide at once. And I love that you can see that and the whole of the word there in front of you. I'm going to read here out of 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 4. So hear the word of the Lord this morning. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his leg and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spears had weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. And then verse 10. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly frightened. I think that's a little bit of an understatement. Greatly dismayed. We need to talk to the translators there. They were afraid. They were incredibly afraid. His armor alone weighed 125 pounds. The tip of his spear alone weighed 15 pounds. This was a massive man, close to eight feet tall. And, and this guy is spewing blasphemy about God and taunting God's people. You can understand why Israel didn't see themselves as the winning team that day. Now, I got to say today, Satan's tactics are not always as direct. You don't just see a giant out there. But let's not deny that there are Goliaths that are out there today that are running around and they are likewise spewing blasphemy. They're defying all of God's people all you need to do is skim the headlines, right, to see what's going on. And it's equally as terrifying, especially for me when I think about, especially our kids. And so here, as we begin this special season in our church, here's the question I have. So what's to be our response? What, how are we to respond 
to what's going on around us in the culture. And I want to say, like Israel, we only have two options. It's not too long ago, there was a columnist named Rod Dreher. Uh, he received a lot of press for this column he wrote about how the church should respond. And he called this option the Benedict option. In 408 AD, as the Visigoths are about to overthrow the whole of the Roman Empire in Rome, there's a guy named Benedict who led a strategic retreat into the desert with people from the church. And over the next few centuries, it was these Benedictine monks who held on to the truth of Christianity, who guarded the scriptures while Europe was covered in barbarian darkness. And it was through these monasteries that ultimately they laid the groundwork for the rebirth of Christianity in all of Europe. And then eventually it spread out again from there. And Dreyer says, listen, we're fighting a losing game. The country's not ours anymore. This is not our culture anymore, to which I want to say, I'm not sure it ever was. Nonetheless, his point stands. One option for the church is to withdraw. And I got to admit, you know, the Benedict option, it has its appeal. At very least, God has used this strategy in the past. And at least it's self-aware enough to be realistic that there's a real challenge before us. So maybe we should just play it safe. You know, protect ourselves and make sure our kids are insulated enough. And then when there's openness for another day in the culture, then, then we go out. It's a tempting option. And I think in our own lives, we have to decide, is this the option that I've been taking? But the passage we just read shows us another option, doesn't it? There's another option for the church. There's always the David option. 1 Samuel 17, 32, David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. And so this young kid armed only with a sling, five stones and his faith goes out to confront the giant Goliath. Why? Why did he have confidence to do this? And, and this is what I want to emphasize for us this morning. Because he knew he was on the winning team. He knew we are on the winning team. And when Goliath sees David, he says this. Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, if that were me, I would have ran out of there like my hair was on fire, right? Not that I have much hair these days, but that was not what David did. Listen to what he did. He said, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly into the battle to meet the Philistine. Let me say that again. David ran quickly into the battle. There is the other option for the church. Despite our fears, despite the temptation to withdraw to safety, we could run into the battle. And why? Because no matter what it looks like, we all know we are the winning team. And when you look down the aisle, don't do this right now, okay? I know there's a part of you that goes, but that other person is on the same team. And sometimes it's easier for us to think that, well, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, the difference is the Holy Spirit and us, whoever is sitting in that role. Together, we are the winning team. 
Not because of what we've done, but because who he is. And here, this is what I'm convinced. I'm convinced that our response to the church in large part depends on how we see ourselves. Do we see ourselves as the winning team? Do we see ourselves simply as a child who can't do anything against the giant? Or do we see ourselves, yes, as mostly helpless, and yet we have God on our side? Do we see ourselves as the church of Jesus Christ? Listen to what Jesus said about his church out of Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. So in other words, Jesus is saying, my people will be so rock solid, so strong, have so deep a foundation that no matter the odds, no matter the opposition, the gates of hell will not overcome them. Jesus says his team, that means you and me, we are on the winning team. No matter what it looks like sometimes, no matter how discouraging it can be, Jesus wins. In fact, he's already won. And so together, as we start this new journey together, do we believe this? See, that's the part where you're supposed to say, yes, pastor, we believe this, okay? (laughs) (laughs) It gets me a little nervous, but, okay. Yes, do we believe this? Okay, all right. All right, we have two options. We could withdraw, but I'm convinced that the Lord wants us to take the David option. I'm convinced that the battle's far from lost, and with God's help, there's victory still to be won. It may not look the way it did in the past, but with God's help, there are people who still will come to faith in Jesus Christ. With God's help, there are places where the kingdom of God can be established and shine and give glory to him. We can't do this alone like David, but we can do it together as we run into the battle together. So my prayer today is that this would be the first of many days to come, that we together run into the battle and glorify God because we are his winning team. Now, this would be a pretty good place to stop the sermon, right? It's a nice rally call, and we all say, yes, we're on the winning team. Pastor, go, go. But I think it's important for us to keep going a little bit into why David responded the way he did and what it looks like for us to run into the battle. You see, David only went into the battle like this because he was actually well-prepared You may not look like it because this is a young kid. He wasn't just filled with youthful bravado. He had good reason for his confidence. Listen to what he says to Saul. He says in verse 36, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion... And from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You see, the Lord had put David through lion and bear training before this, right? And so he had this unrelenting confidence because God had placed him through training that prepared him for that day. Now, there's a word that Jesus uses Uh, for lion and bear training, uh, it's called discipleship. To follow after him is preparation so that we can be then equipped well to go into the world. And discipleship is taking that seriously, to become like Jesus, so that when the trial comes, when we are confronted by Goliath, that we can have confidence that God has delivered me before, he will deliver me again, and I will stand with confidence now and proclaim the goodness of God. Um, 
a number of years ago, four years ago, my kids had this idea that they wanted to do martial arts. And uh, down the street in the center of our little town, there was a place to do this. And so they started this, and then Stephanie pointed out to me, hey, you know, Mark, for just a few dollars more with their little family package, you could do this with the kids too. <laughs> I'm like, you know, really, really? And so I thought about it and said, okay, I'll give it a try. Now, if anybody's ever done anything like this, the first thing they do is they dress you in this white, white stuff, right? It was really, and then they put a white belt around you. It basically says you are absolutely incompetent, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you don't know what you're doing, and everybody in there looks like Bruce Lee, and you're, you're just like, I... After a while, they train you. They train you, you know, to do certain moves and certain... And at the end of the first training, they make you break a board. And you're looking at this thing, and I swear, you know, it looks like a two-by-four, and thinking, there's no... Hey, I'm going to do this. Really, it's more like balsa at this point, but there's no way I'm doing this. And I, you know, my family takes a video of this and I look back and I see this first time I'm petrified. And, and the second time, I mean, I literally was doing this like seven times. Like I, and, and I hurt myself. Like, there was no ice there, so they had to go to the convenience store and buy a bag of frozen corn. It was bad, okay? <laughs> but just recently, uh, before we moved, uh, there was one last test. And I just remembered thinking, this is so different than the first time I did this. And, you know, and if you really would like to see living proof, you can friend me on Facebook and you can go and see it's up there, okay? But being able to go through, I went through six boards. I'm like, this is crazy. I never would have thought this. And, and here, here's what the Lord wants to do with you. If it looks intimidating to you right now to go through that first spiritual board, trust him. Trust him. That over time, he will build you up and he will give you that next spiritual belt. You will be so much different if you trust him over time and allow him to make you more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And so we don't run into the battle immediately. We train up so that we can be effective as disciples. And just to be clear, discipleship is not simply learning about Jesus. There is such a misunderstanding. I know a lot of my Bible. Good, so does Satan, okay? But there's a huge difference. Do you allow him to transform your life so that when you go out into the world that you shine, that you shine brightly for him? So it's not just allowing to inform our minds. It's allowing him to transform the whole of our lives, growing stronger, and then we trust him to help us to do the same for others. So Barna did another extensive study on the differences in lifestyles of people who are born-again Christians and people who are not. They studied areas of gambling, pornography, stealing, consulting a psychic, fighting and physical abuse, drunkenness, drug abuse, divorce, adultery, lying, revenge, generosity, and gossip. And you know what they found? that in each of these categories, there was no statistical difference between the people who claimed to be born-again Christians and the people of the world. So that is not a description of a team that is confronting and winning against Goliath. That is a description of a team that's being assimilated by Goliath. And I can say this in front of you because I have no idea. I have no idea where you are in your spiritual walk, and so this is not me confronting anything. This is me just speaking about the world today and our call to be disciples. And I want to say to be a disciple today is not optional. To train daily is not optional, because if you're not being made into the image of Jesus Christ, studying Scripture, 
being regular at worship, which by the way, in person is so, so much better. Although I'm really glad you're there online. Okay. You can't hug people online. Okay. Uh, and so if you're not being intentional about it, you will be assimilated and discipled by something else. Okay. There's no neutral ground. And if we are not fully committed to our biblically grounded discipleship, we will never be equipped to confront the giant. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So essential to what it means to follow after Jesus Christ is a willingness to lay down our lives. And what I want to illustrate from David is not so much, let's carry the sling and the bravado. It's the willingness to lay down our lives as we go into the battle. You see, because did you, did you ever realize I, there's nothing in scripture that tells us that God told David, go in there and I will show you. This is what I'm going to do. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know that God was going to guide his stone. All that David knew was, I'm tired of hearing this guy. He said, I'm on the winning team. And even if I die, I'm going out there because I can't take it anymore. I need to represent the God whom I believe in. So he set aside even his own life. He was a disciple. He didn't yet know his name was Jesus, but he went out for him. And so for us, what does it mean to run into the battle? It means to lay down our lives for the Lord and for others. And as much as I think it's great to post things on social media and wear Christian t-shirts, put a bumper sticker on there, so much better that our lives just offer the, the fragrance of Jesus Christ where we go. And we become the light in our office places, in places where people have never really met a Christian. That's what it's really about. And so let me ask this morning, what about, what about us? And what about you, especially as we begin this new year? How are you doing in your walk with Jesus Christ? I mean, do you feel like you've stagnated? You see, because Jesus hasn't, he wants to take you deeper. To use my analogy from before, there's new belts to be won. There's new boards to be broken. He wants to strengthen you. And he's not done with you. I don't care what your age is, by the way. If you're still here, there's a reason God has you here. Okay? Right? Yeah. And more than that, if you're a young person, do not deny you are not the future church. You are the present church, okay? <laughs> All right. That's the youth minister in me still that's there. Okay, so running into the battle involves laying down our lives, loving one another, showing the world through serving the world. Showing the world that we follow a different sort of king. I don't care if you follow the donkey or the elephant. Okay, we follow the king of kings, yes. right? So he shows us a way to lay down our lives in ways that rise way above all these other things. And it all involves laying down our lives, dying to ourselves every day, so that then as we go out from our homes, we take Jesus Christ into places where other people need to see this. And we make that our number one priority. And I want to note, you know, Jesus didn't say that the gates of hell wouldn't overcome a particular church. He said it would not overcome the whole of his church. And so the question as we enter this new season is, we want together, do we recommit ourselves today to lay down our lives for Christ and his gospel. This is another point where you say, yes, pastor. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me wrap up by saying this. Look, I, I, 
I grew up rooting for losing teams, okay? That was more of a birth defect. But for you, you have been chosen by God to be on his winning team. Chosen, not because of your abilities, but because you are loved with an everlasting love. And with God's help, there are battles for us yet to win. I'll finish with this. And J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, just as the forces of evil are just crowding around uh, the army at the gate of Mordor, King Aragorn yells, hold your ground. A day may come when the courage of men fails, but it is not this day. This day we fight. And there may come a day to withdraw, but it's not this day. Today, we commit ourselves to discipleship training so that we can run into the battle. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and hell will never conquer it. Do you believe this? Yes. See that there? <laughs> oh, all right. You are on the winning team, people. So let's lay down our lives together and go into this battle, giving him the glory. Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, on this day, we recognize that you are the head of the church. You are the one who deserves all the glory and honor, and we are so privileged to partner together through your Holy Spirit to go into this battle. Father, we long for the day when the battle will be over and Jesus will reign in full, and there will be no more striving, and we can rest because you, Lord, are king over all in ways that the world sees clearly. But until that day, Lord, help us to run into the battle together. Prepare us and help us, Lord, to want to lay down our lives for you. Show us those areas, Lord, where we've been reluctant. Give us the courage to pick up our cross and die to those areas. Give us the love, Lord, to motivate us to want to do that. And then, Lord, use us. Use us to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Not just individually, but use PCC. Use PCC to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And we look forward to all that you're going to do, Lord. Thank you for this day. And I specifically just say thank you for the honor. It is to serve you and to serve together with these people. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Amen.